Hey, hello, I'm live, and no, I, I don't sit around there looking at everything like everybody else, but I'm David DeHill, so I'm the dissident, I'm a dissident science and critical thinker, and this is my live broadcast for Friday. Today is December 7th, um, mom's birthday. Rest in, may she rest in peace. If you haven't seen uh, my mom, you can see her in my movie. Um, it was a great time we had together, part of our lives where we went around to lots of scientists and we actually uh, met them, had her talk to them, and it was quite a, an amazing time. So very, very uh, uh, proud of the film, proud of the my editors, everybody who contributed to it, including the uh, music by Michael Ruggieri. But if you haven't seen it, go to EinsteinWrong.com. But dedication to my mom. I think I've got some stuff here with her. Got her hat, actually over there she kept the hat that uh, we got for her a couple years ago but anyways um, I appreciate everybody uh, I'm getting more and more subscribers also my dad's been doing some great work so if you haven't seen my dad's channel or some of the other ch channels uh, take a look at them uh, it's really great interesting my dad's talking about equals MC squared something that not, not many people talk about um, but my dad's very uh, uh, pedantic with those things very uh, uh, how do you say uh, he's much more thorough than I am. He prepares his stuff and, uh, oh, look at that. I'm on here live listening to myself delayed. And uh, welcome. I've, I can see I've got a couple people. And uh, welcome to my Friday night. But I was talking about my dad. He uh, has a couple of uh, videos. He's making, actually, he said he's making another one in E equals MC squared. You should check it out. Uh, how do you get there? You can go to youtube.particle.guru. Check him out. Of course, we have other people who are in our group that have really great channels. You want to check out uh, Jeff Yi, uh, Energy Wave Theory. Just look it up on Go uh, Google, probably on Google too, but uh, YouTube, and you will see his uh, channel. He's got some really great videos. Actually, he does some really good historical research for his videos. Uh, he is an etherist, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about today about that. I am trying to prepare. A video about ether but I thought maybe I'd talk a little bit about it tonight because it is the most popular uh, model out there today I am not my per myself an etherist but uh, there's some really good models out there Glenn Borkert has one uh, Jeff you know Jeff Yee has another um, and there's quite a few people in our group that have oh my gosh Franklin who who has one um, uh, Yonel Denou, uh, he has one. Uh, Yonel Denou, who's he? Is he's a physicist from and scientist from Romania, who has one of the greatest uh, experiments of our time, in my opinion, which is just simple water underwater experiments. Yonel Denou is I O N E L, and his last name is D Denou. It's I think D I N U or D N U D. E N U. I'm not sure in Denu. I think it's D I N U. And, and water experiments. We'll take a look, and you'll see that he is an etherist, uh, talking about how magnetic fields are actually flow in ether, which is uh, quite interesting. And uh, welcome, hey uh, Lisa. There she is. My, <laughs> we got to set up a time. I want to set up a time with her, but uh, uh, so we can uh, do something. We'll we will put that in our on our list of things to do. But I've been watching uh, her channel. She's a total. She's got a pretty good system going there. I know she's got um, uh, her regular viewers, and she has things she does online. It's quite a a nice uh, community, and uh, I've I've seen that. And also, um, you know, we uh, I guess somebody one of one of the other channels decided to do some. Uh, how, how do you say? not criticism but watch my channel and and make some comments but um, and I think uh, Lisa commented on there but it's really not really worth talking too much about uh, everybody uh, you know he's a critical thinker that's great for him but the methods and me of that of what that person does I'm not a big fan I know he's around because uh, I can see his thumbs down I got I almost get always a thumbs down from uh, I'm pretty sure I know who that is but uh uh, Tyler Tom. Hi, David. Did you read uh, uh, Heretical Verities by Tom Fitz? 
You know, Tom Phipps, um, I actually had a chance to meet the man before he passed on. Um, who is a big fan of Tom Phipps is Greg um, Volk. Uh, we do have information on our website. If you go to db for database.naturalphilosophy.org, look him up. Or you can go to naturalphilosophy.org and look him up. Uh, we have that. And I think it's uh, book two. I may have his book somewhere. But I'm not a big Phipps guy. Um, but an uh, interesting, interesting fellow. Uh, right, book in the distance. But yeah, uh, Tom Phipps was sort of uh, well uh, read. I would say in the what I call the first generation of this uh, this group, and so um, that is uh, something that uh, if you talk with the older guys in our group, they've read them, and a lot of them unfortunately have passed on, and um, that's uh, not something that I like to talk about too much because I, I miss a lot of the old guard from the MPA and the Natural Philosophy Alliance which we used to be until we had some people try to infiltrate our group uh, oh my gosh it's just not worth talking about but uh, maybe someday I'll talk about it because it is certainly uh, part of the uh, history of why we are the Na uh, John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society not the Natural Philosophy Alliance um, sometimes there's like a there's disagreements on, on how to run it, and and uh, ah, it's just a long story. It's just a long story you don't want to know, but the good thing is what came out of it was a much better uh, group, but a lot of those people have passed on. Um, a lot, you know, uh, you can go to our memorial page. Maybe I can get that up here. So I don't know if I even have a memorial. I don't know if I've got that uh, bookmarked because I can put in subdomains and then that gets you to places easier but I don't think um, nope I didn't do that but I should probably do that uh, but we do have a memorial page of the people uh, who passed on and I think Tom Phipps should be there of course but we try to keep our database up to date of all at least all, all almost 3,000 dissident scientists that we have in our database so um, time. he also had another popular book called uh, Old physics for new. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can find these things that you're talking about. Um, let's see. Before I, I like to get to the page before I uh, show you me getting around and everything. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh boy, that uh, that gets poignant. Let me uh, get to the browser here. E ba 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 buoy. A little too big. There you go. So if you go to John Chappell um, and you go to uh, our, let's see, members, and you go to memorials, you'll see the people actually in chronological order backwards. Man, it just, it's so, I, I don't like to come to this page because um, it's pretty emotional for me because I know a lot of these guys and a lot of these people. Um, Lou, Lou Allen La, La, La Follette. Um, she was. She actually helped us with this. Uh, man, it was just she. She died suddenly. She was 83, and um, this year. Oh my gosh! And uh, she was. She helped us greatly uh, with our uh, CMPS. The uh, her her bo uh, boy. Her son was a lawyer and helped us get the paperwork for the 1072C3. I don't know. We didn't do a 5013C because we you can get into trouble people trying to take you over and that kind of stuff. Uh, Glenn Baxter, um, and then my mom, bless her soul. And then there's Tom Phipps. He died only in 2016. Um, and if we can click on that, um, oh my goodness, there's uh, Alexander Scarborough. He was one of the first people to uh, really introduce expanding Earth to the NPA. That's a picture from of him. He was in my movie, and he was actually was one of the first people to receive our award. No, the first year we gave out awards from our group called the Sanyak Award. He received it with, um, um, uh, he's here, yeah. He received it with Paul Grineau, uh, Alex Scarborough. Uh, and there's Hart Halton Arp. My goodness, these, oh, I, I don't like this. It doesn't seem that long ago. I remember talking to these people and 
remembering what was going on when I found out about them. Milo Wolf. These are the old guard. Um, Dishington. Uh, Glendine. I remember he had his work. But um, let me click on uh, Thomas Phipps and see what we have here. Um, uh, because it's sort of uh, squashed together. You got his PhD. Wow, look at that. Educated at Harvard. Uh, PhD in nuclear physics. Worked during World War II. Morse, uh, PM Morse's research group. Um, wow, returning to Harvard and experimental thesis and uh, some of the articles uh, he's uh, written. I don't think these, for some reason, they're not in our database. Um, uh, maybe he has some of his uh, books there. But we, you know, hey, oh, wait a minute. Of course, they're here. I've got it, forgot. Dummy. Look at that. Oh, my gosh. You can tell uh, Greg Volk was very good. Let's click on, forgot how to use our own database here. Books, old physics for new. There it is. And, oh, this is way big. Uh, heretical verities. R mathematical themes and physical description. There's another one there. Yeah, he won the Sagnac Award. I, I I have that in the database. I don't know how I've, if I've got a display of that. But, yeah, um, he did. Uh, he, he was in 2010. It's in my movie. He's in that looking. I remember seeing him. He wasn't too thrilled with our samba dancers. <laughs> It was supposed to be a shock. It was sort of fun in the film because I got all those very smarty pants. So we call our, you know, these guys smarty pants in a good way. Um, and uh, we had some of those dancers like, oh my gosh. In fact, um, events, let's see. It, we, we, we cataloged all this stuff. Uh, natural, the 20th Natural Philosophy Alliance that was uh, um, yeah, five years, seven years ago, eight years ago. You can see all the way back. Um, he was in the fourth Natural Philosophy Conference, so two decades and one year ago. Um, so these are the events. We cataloged everything. We were crazy from 2008 to 2011, about then. Um, we cataloged everybody we could. Um, abstracts, my goodness, 84 abstracts this guy has. Um, yep, his last way, all the way to 2013. The, rel uh, the relativity of simul simultaneity is a mistake. Oh my goodness! Um, for those of you who don't know, um, simultaneity is like, well, how do we know when things, two things happen, happen simultaneously? If you uh, believe in infinity, you're going to find out that actually nothing happens simultaneously. Uh, no matter what you do, if you shoot two things at one object and you say, oh, they hit at the same time, if you get way, way, way down the microscopic level, they'll never hit at the same time, ever. Uh, but uh, that's a big different story, but uh, very interesting. You can click on these things. This is sort of good. It gives you an idea of how you can work. Look at these things. Special relativity employs uh, two types of time invariant. Let me get this uh, so you can see this better. Forget. Yeah, there we go. Now I can scroll it up. Uh, special relativity theory employs two types of time, invariant proper time uh, and invariant frame time. A return to the simplicity of a single invariant time parameter is offered by the GPS method of correcting clock running rates so as to compens compensate environmental effects due to the motion and gravity. Uh, parameterizing timekeeping in terms of a single time allows restoration of distance simultaneity and surprising number of other amenities in pre-relativistic physics. Basically what he's saying, folks, is that there's this thing about simultaneity and there's frames of reference in, in, in we have that old thing that if I, uh, Einstein's on a train and he turns on a flashlight and that light goes forward and he's moving with uh, the flashlight, he's going to measure the, s the speed of C, but the guy watching the train go by isn't going to measure the speed of C plus the speed of the train. They're all supposed to, to um, measure the uh, speeds of C and therefore that's why time has to uh, change, uh, slow down, length contracts, mass increases, etc. But uh, very interesting, he's basically saying no you don't need two frames. Very much what Carazzani, Dr. Ricardo Carazzani, my mentor, uh, said, so that's very interesting. Yeah, what is your view on the Cygnus of Alexander Scarborough's work? Uh, yeah, well Tyler, Tom, um, <laughs> 
Actually, I was the one who uh, suggested him, and uh, actually to the protests of others. Uh, and the reason uh, they were protesting me was because I wanted to try to do a variety, whereas we gave it to uh, Peter Grineau and uh, uh, Eberly Spencer. They were, and if you were to look in the dissonant world, those two people were sort of uh, giants in the dissonant world, whereas Scarborough wasn't, but I knew he was not well. You can see in this picture, he was quite a striking uh, man. I, I know his uh, daughter's still alive and actually participated in our group a, a few years later, and she does communicate with me once in a while. But uh, back, basically it was because I wanted to give him uh, uh, an award before he, he, he went, passed on. He lived actually a lot longer uh, than uh, we thought, but you know, uh, he got somewhat senile and, uh, as he got older. But um, he uh, he he has here's a really great story about um, Alexander Scarborough. I was sitting having uh, dinner with him. It was at the University of Connecticut, and I was with him, his his uh, daughter, and some other people. I think Peter Grineau may have been there, uh, but um, uh, he he reached into his pocket because he knew. I think it was the year we gave him the award. And so he was very grateful because, you know, I was the one who pushed for it. So, you know, but he stuck his hand into his uh, jacket and pulled out this lump. And it was like this really heavy clay kind of thing. It was black tarish kind of thing. And actually it wasn't, well, it wasn't so much that. It, I'll, I'll take that back. It looked, it felt more like shale or something. It felt more like a, a igneous rock. And it was had layers. It seemed like it almost had layers. And so when I got it, it I, I apologize. It didn't look like um, uh, a, a lump of clay or anything. It was much more like rock, and it wasn't too heavy. Um, I, I, I'm, now I remember. It wasn't too heavy. Um, it, it was. It was rocks are heavy, but it wasn't as a. If it were a rock, it would have been uh, much heavier. It was a sort of a lighter looking rock. And I looked at it, and he goes, "What? What do you think that is, Dave?" And I looked at it and I said, well, it's some type of rock, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, it's sort of light, reminds me of, he says, what, well, what does it remind you of? I said, coal. And you know what he told me, and I'll never forget. He said, it's oil. He had taken some crude oil and basically put it in a container, let it sit for a very, very long time. And it almost it became coal with no pressure or anything. It's like going on its way to coal. And one of the things about the expanding Earth theory, and that was what he as much uh, talked about, was that oil is abiotic. Biotic is bio, is life. A in front of something. Abiotic means not life. So he was saying oil is abiotic. It's not fossil fuel. It's actually manufactured inside the Earth. And if you think, of, think about it, there's a lot of uh, evidence for that. And one of the biggest pieces of evidence is way, way, way too far down. And there's way, way, way too much of it. This idea that there were so many plants and animals at this time to produce this in incredible amount. And every time we drill down further, we get more. And so uh, according to expanding Earth, the uh, uh, water, methane, um, and oil are produced within the... They say the mantle. Uh, I, I, would, I would not be surprised if it wasn't. But uh, actually... Mainstream science in the last two years have, have come out with a several articles saying they're thinking that water may be in fact manufactured down in, underneath the ground because they're finding water at incredible depths of 20,000 feet below the surface and it's trapped water and they're saying that water can't be down there because it's seeped down so water is coming from somewhere inside the earth and they're going mm, maybe it's down there so that's sort of the story I have about uh, Alex Scarborough, great guy. Um, also appears would be recommend from Neil Munch. Thanks. Also, which papers would? Oh, okay. Uh, Neil Munch. I will tell you another story about Neil Munch. This is great. A great, great guy, and um, his whole thing. He's got a lot of abstracts. A couple of stories about him. He um, he. I'll keep this picture up there. But basically, he um, was an engineer. And in 1996, when I was trying to um, spread the word about Karazani's work, it took me a number of years to get Karazani's work together. 
and I got his a paper of Karazani's, uh, or I wrote a paper about about Karazani's work uh, on special relativity, and I submitted it, and I found somehow I found this is before the internet. Well, ninety five I had some I found I think I found them via the internet because of I went to some groups, those old old bulletin board groups in Google. And I found the MPA. I had found some people talking about it via email because there was email that back then, of course. And um, then I found about it, and they were having a, a, their third conference. And I thought, okay. And they said, yeah, they um, they're dissident science, blah blah blah. I think I got somehow someone mailed me a picture or photocopy or something like that of their their newsletter or maybe even sent it to me. But I, I ended up submitting a, an abstract to the the conference. They accepted it and uh, got on a plane and flew out there. Um, I didn't have a, uh, a rental car at the time. I was 36. Um, I was married, no kids, living in California, and flew out there and stupidly didn't rent a car. Should have done that. And I uh, Neil Munch came and picked me up, and that was the first person I met in this dissident group super nice guy and uh, remember him uh, a short guy bald guy at that time you can see in this this picture he's a little thinner but he was a chubby uh, bald headed guy really uh, really full of energy really almost you know kinetic a little bit and I heard uh, you know later on that he told me he had some type of condition that made him like sort of hyper but uh, he took me to uh, the MPA and, and throughout the years, he was an ambassador for assumptions. One of the biggest problems was is people are writing papers. The mainstream does all its work without telling you its assumptions. Do you assume that the universe is finite? Do you assume that the Big Bang is correct? Do you assume that light is a particle and a wave and we don't know what that is? Do you assume in our group? Do you assume there's an ether? Uh, do you assume that, um, uh, oh, do you assume that you have an infinity? Uh, those kinds of things. So assumptions are those things that you think that are in the universe that you can't argue, that you can't prove. You can't argue. We can't prove anything, but you can't really put a basis to it. You know, there's mass, for instance, in my father and I's particle model. There's mass. And there's mass moves. It can collide. It can be captured in orbit around other mass because of smaller mass around the fields. But basically, the, we assume that all the universe is made of just moving mass and collisions and from that you can basically uh, construct the entire universe but that's an assumption and what's it's so much so that I actually do have assumptions and let me go to myself here um, how do I get there okay I'm gonna do a our science find and let's see if I have some assumptions but um, I would recommend, I'll, I'll get to him. I just want to show, tell you about the story about him before we get to it. Um, David D. Hilster. There we go. And um, ba 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 ba. There I'm at. Assumptions. Oh, uh, I have them in the database, but I'm not. I'm not. Uh, let me see if I can hack this. Assumptions. I've taken them out. Take, taken them out. I've taken them out. Nope. Okay. I'm going to go back to Neil. But anyways, we do have assumptions. That he 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 put them so much in our head that we uh, started. I put in the database what people's assumptions were, and they can literally list all their assumptions and definitions. So if we go back to Neil, uh, let me see if there's some papers I could recommend to you. Abstracts. There are quite a few of them. Assumption uh, value of assumption controls in advanced physics. That's his last paper, and and you can read it online. I highly recommend that one. How about these? Uh, simple assumption errors. Real, uh, that's a really good one. I remember that paper in his presentation. Um, so uh, I would read that one. Let's see. I don't have many others at the full papers there. So. They're in our proceedings. And man, we had some big proceedings too. Look at these suckers. This one's from volume nine. 
Well, I, I remember I put it together, but who really organized it was Greg Volk. Look at this sucker. It's got 670 some pages, this thing. Uh, it's the Proceedings of the Natural Philosophy Alliance, and this one is from 2012, and it was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We did, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, our proceedings today are much more, uh, that's last year's, but our, this year's is a little bit bigger, but our proceedings uh, are actually, uh, uh, a little bit smaller, obviously, because we've uh, uh, gone through the transition to the CMPS, and uh, we didn't lose people. It's just getting back to our. We we also are not including in the electric universes and uh, with us that much anymore. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna go back. Wow, lots of people here. Welcome everybody. Um, talked about that one. Dissonant. Yeah, Papa Neil Munch. I did. Gosh, I feel terrible. No, can't be all right. No, no problem. Uh, let's not uh, like it's not fossil fuel. I heard this too. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Is um, there's a couple of problems when I was a kid, even or even when even uh, in my adult life, when I was looking at how much oil they're finding everywhere and just the amount of it, I'm thinking to myself, how could this just be? Um, organic material over a couple million millions of years I just couldn't believe it something was not believable to me and then when when I found about about the expanding earth and talk with some of those people those scientists they're saying look it's coming from within uh, water is a good one because water is easy where it comes from within because uh, just go to any book go to on the internet find out about water it's the number one problem in uh, cosmology of the formation of the earth where the heck did it come they said oh it came from comets but there weren't enough of them why would it come around and stay around because a lot of it would be burned off go off into space whatever but um, regardless um, uh, the uh, if you go into the, the way I look look up uh, smokers I'm gonna look up that uh, ooh, ocean sm black smokers no these are not people of the the uh, color skin black who smoke folks that's not what I'm saying <laughs> this is uh, uh, really just I'm gonna see if I can get this up for you this is all related to the oil by the way uh, Lisa and um, uh, I'm gonna show you one I'm gonna wait till it gets on here make sure I've got what I want before I show you guys but um, I want to see if uh, find one of these where it's gushing out here we go yeah I'm gonna show you that Da, 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 da. There we go. So these are on the ocean floor where the um, Earth is expanding. That's what we say um, because it's supposed to be subducting. So imagine in the middle of the oceans you have the new seabed. This is accepted by everyone. 100% of geologists around the world accept this. So it's not uh, people who are in plate tectonics and think expansion tectonics is a joke. So this is all uh, believed by everyone. Now if you watch this what did I do now? Okay. Now watch up close. There is smoke coming out of it, but it's coming out with water. It's a hydrothermal event. Vent. See this word here? Hydrothermal. Hydro is water. Thermo means heated. So this is a this stuff is spewing water. Where is it coming from? Where is it come? Oh, it's coming from. It's just pump. No it's got to come from somewhere so this is what uh, uh, is said to be where water's coming it's very convenient that it seems as our oceans expand enough water comes in to fill it now we may be able to find out um, I will take that away now no more uh, need to look at that but um, when you take it's it is kind of quite curious as to why the oceans sort of fill up uh, as we go, but I think there is a from some of the uh, expanding earth people an imbalance I don't remember if more water is coming out or less water is coming out to fill as the surface goes forward, but it seems to be somewhat balanced where was the water when all the oceans weren't there and expanding? shallow seas 
come here to Florida, go out into the Everglades and you will see what that is. And that's why you see all these pictures of dinosaurs wading around in swamps because there were no oceans. Uh, yes, uh, there were some, there was some opening up during the uh, uh, ages. Go check out Neil Adams videos, check out uh, James, Dr. James Maxlow, etc. Let's see if I can find anything on A abiotic oil um, may not be able to find uh, abiotic petroleum origin um, let's turn explain a number of scientific theories oh huh it's really interesting I'll, I'll show you this uh, here we go abiotic petroleum origin the Wikipedia has something abiotic rational wiki go to rational wiki for the uh, mainstream non-critical thinking parroting website that will take everybody including me and uh, call us crackpots and all that uh, that's what their joy in life is I guess it's pretty sad but abiotic lawyer and abiotic oil hypothesis proposed that a small amount of oil originates from not <laughs> they even got it wrong no all of it folks all of it a l l Oh my goodness. Anyways, um, uh, that's that. You can read a little bit about it, but the, I don't, we'll have to put that on to our um, uh, science woke a an article about that. But that's very interesting. So the abiotic oil is something that uh, makes total sense. Methane, oil, and water um, is uh, manufactured in in inside the earth. In fact, if you look at the stuff, you don't find like I think some of the I, I, don't quote me on this but some people who have studied this more <clears throat> say that you're not going to really find any um, biological materials in this stuff and, and whatever so going to go back uh, hydrocarbon soup instead of a carbohydrate soup <laughs> Kenneth M. Price Jr. YouTube channel for oil, etc. His main focus is the Titanic and Hindenburg and why they were sabotaged. He had to the whole oil situation with the mm hmm. Well, that's just another information about the history. Also, a fellow across the pond named Crane worked on the best. He said Russian sea oil is a non fossil fuel as well. Could be. Uh, we have some really great Russian scientists. I wonder if I can do that. I don't know if we have that ability anymore, but I used to have a page where we had everybody from different countries and we had 78 countries. I wonder if we have that. Uh, I, I do have a page for that. I've got to revive those pages. Um, scientists, let's see if I have those links before I show you. Oh yeah, look at that, Dave. He's a programmer. Yeah, that's what I do for a living. Not here, but here we go. This is a pretty cool one. Haven't seen this, have you? That's why you're watching live. Okay, well, <laughs> that's why I make up stuff to pretend while you're watching. Okay, that's uh. Anyways, uh, no, I, I enjoy these, uh, especially when people are making comments. I greatly appreciate people who are loud mouth and talkity talkity. That's why I like Lisa so much. Here we go. We have 76 countries of the almost 3,000. Um, I used to have counts. Yeah, oh, here we go. Um, Algeria, come in, look at this. Albania, se Argentina, seven. Um, Ricardo Carozani, but I think he's listed in America now. Um, Australia, 60. Quite a lot of Australians. Austria, 20. Belarus, three. I, I don't even know this myself. Bosnia Herzegovina, three. Brazil, 27. We're getting more and more people. Brazil, você tem brasileiros aí? Fala comigo, cara. Let's see. Bulgaria, Canada, of course, 102. Whoa. Chile, 3. China, 37. Yeah, there's like quite a few people. You can see we're all over the world we are. France has quite a lot. Germany, ah, vá sim. We have Einstein. No, we don't have Einstein in here and uh, quite a few Greece 21 in Greece man I haven't looked this in a while 33 in India yeah we have some really good people uh, from India Africa as well Italy continued so they've got quite a few United King Kingdom so let's go to the bottom and see what we have there United Kingdom 111 
And of course, we'll have the United States, and that probably starts way up here, which has the most catalog, which we have 1,110. We are the kings of crackpots. <laughs> Just kidding, of course. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's when I call it that. Anyways, uh, quite a few people. So uh, I was talking about this because of why I have totally lost my way. Oh, uh, you were saying people in Russia. Let's see. Russia. Russia, 91. See, I was not wrong. Quite a few. Quite a few there. So um, really great scientists from Russia. In fact, I've been... I've been wanting to have our conference in St. Petersburg because it's so beautiful. They used to do those kinds of things, but they'd be very small conferences. But there you go. You can see all those people. Oh, what else are here while we're here? Birthdays, professions. What do people say they do? 397 professions. Accountants, geologists, 24. Artist, 14. Professors, 14. Independent research, 49. Astronomers, 17. Authors, bunches of them, 38. Um, inventors, 80. Professors of mathematics, professor of mathematical physics. Professor of mathematical physics. Well, probably spelled differently. No, I'm sorry. Professor of natural philosophy. Wow. Professors of physics, 78. Hey, you uh, uh, guys who are uh, against Einstein and the Big Bang and particle physics, you think you have to throw it away. You guys don't. Titles, buddy. Professors of physics, 78 of them, yes. Andreas Cease, I know him. Let's go down here, Ronald uh, Brundish. Uh, uh, Cahill, I've heard of him. Uh, Chang, I've heard of him. Quite a few here. Yeah, I don't know a whole lot of them, but they list themselves. I know uh, Yonel Dunu, I'm sure. Well, he should be here. If he's not, then he should be. Yeah, he should be. Smolsky, I've heard of him. Oh, yeah, this is a Russian guy. Yes, I know him, too. He was a physics teacher. And in my film, he says, I have come here to the conference to let you know to help my junior brothers <laughs> i love that guy he is absolutely a character i love him dearly wonderful wonderful man so yeah cool stuff oh wait a minute you're not seeing this i am so sorry did i did i not show you the the countries as well did i not show you those Oh boy. Okay, anyways, here, here's where I'm at, and I wasn't showing you. I'm talking about this just going on. If you go to our database, dbnaturalphilosophy.org, go to scientists, you can go to, oh, there's their assumptions. <sighs> I made this stuff, I don't know. Here's the countries, and, and I don't know if I showed you this. There we go. Sorry. 76 countries, going through it again, Australia, and here's where we see, I am so, so sorry. You should, I wish I had uh, Poland, 27 in Poland. Russia, 91, there we go. You can see them. So if you go to here, um, db.naturalphilosophy.org slash countries, there you get the countries. And of course, if you want to go to the professions like I was doing, what do you think the biggest profession in, 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 in here is? Let me guess which one, independent researcher, inventors is 80. Professor of Physics, 78 folks, 78 in our group. I've told you that already. We, uh, Judge, Duncan Shaw, can anybody tell me what level of judge and what country he's from? Trivia question. I'm not going to let you, somebody tell me. I'm delayed here. Can I can see that uh, this, this comes through. Trivia question. Duncan Shaw is a judge. At what level of a judge was his highest level and from one country is he from? All right, let's see, lecturer, mathematician, 29. 
Editor 40, I'm gonna go down to, there we go, man. That is what I call probably the best profession. I, If I were to tell anyone, if someone asked me, Dave, what is the best profession that you see as a critical thinker? What, what are the, who are the, if you were to pick a profession where you see most of the, the most critical thinkers that you admire, electrical engineer, hands down, why do I know that? I just hanging out with these dudes for a long time. So Okay, let's see here. Anyways, no one's answered my question. Duncan Shaw. Look him up. Alrighty, here we go. Let's go back. Sorry about that. Um, b -b 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 I gotta go back to another bit. Lisa Howard, or was this a really big uh, Paula, Green, Ken Price, da -da -da -da, Lisa Howe. Um, oh, here's here's something assumptions. It's an interesting way. Okay, let me get to the assumptions while I'm here. Remember, I talked about the assumptions under construction. I've got it probably like commented out because I've been trying to make them so you could see all the assumptions from each person and. Oh, Dave, fix it. Um, definitions. I wonder if we have those. Oh, we do, and it's ter terribly uh, uh, fit with the uh, thing. So, definition of absolute motion, constant, dark energy, electric charge, the electron. Look at all the different uh, energy. These are all of our definition for energy, entropy. These are what, what our scientists fill in, and I put them all together by sorting them in the database and coming out what, the, what they are. Look at that. Oh, cool. Something we, we could really do and uh, do well. Birthdays. This is pretty funny. Where's my birthday here? I was like, oh, my gosh, everybody has a birthday on my date. It's like one of the dates that have the most birthdays on them. Yeah, look at that, November 13th. Oh, some of my favorites, Hohenberger. He is somebody who's into structure and color. Really great. Neil Munch, super. If they're in red, they've already passed on. Peter Beckman, another great guy. Dan Winter. Wait a minute. You know who else has it on my birthday? It's, um, gosh darn it. Um, Edward Dowdy, Dr. Dowdy, one of the great guys. Why isn't he here? Maybe he took his birthday out. Okay, let me get back to you guys here. I'm sorry, I think I may not have shown that, so at least uh, I go on, I gotta make sure I see that I've sent that to you on the screen. All right, Andrew um, Burke, boom, 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 call Crane, da, da, da. he's home and he's under sink, get rid of us, and you know and there's a zero chance that crude oil is, is a fossil fuel, another mainstream ludicrous claim. Yay, Radic! Say your name. Radic, Radic, thumbs up to that, I agree with you don't have to agree with me or him but go check it out and you better back it up with something like that I don't subscribe to that science you don't subscribe to you got to use the brain here okay uh, this is in science would you like uh, me to approach Jamar about doing an interview um, this is really interesting, and that was one of the topics, actually, Lisa, I wanted to even talk to you about. I'm ready for this. I know, and I have many friends, and I do have subscribers that are not political progressives. In fact, I have subscribers that are, are very conservative. Creationists, re more religious, less religious, right wing, left wing, all that stuff, because it doesn't matter to me what your politics are. I don't care. We, when we talk science, we talk science. And uh, our, our group is very good at that. But because I am a progressive and I've actually started this YouTube channel because of the progressive people like Jamal, uh, Jamal, I know, Nico House, is, I've already communicated directly with him. He's just about an hour away from me uh, in Miami. Um, I need to be ready for them because when I talk with them, I need to have them be able to go somewhere and their listeners to go somewhere. Right now, our databases aren't just any, not the best place. Our Science Woke website is something we need to get up and running. Um, it's tough because we got to write a bunch of articles that are more, uh, how do you say, articles for the general masses. 
Uh, I'm writing some, but I can't keep up with it. I've got permission from our group to start spending money, $50 an article, to get some people to write some of these four things for it. We'll guide them. We, you know, we know what the content needs to be, and I need to finish my, my articles. I'm going to do that over this the uh, winter break here because I have a lot of time off with vacation. My, my great company allows, uh, I think my next full week is last full week this year is uh, coming up. But I'll write that. So my, my, I, here, here's my pitch, uh, Lisa. I'm going to pitch three things. And um, I will show you. Uh, no, I won't. No, I'm not even going to show you guys. Okay. But anyways, um, I need to get that a little bit better before I even show you guys. Because at least like the Science Woke is far enough along that and and you got I got to make my other website have it so you can't get into it and I didn't really want to uh, I, I don't want to show you now because you can get into it and it ain't done it's just barely started but it's really good so I have a website that's going to be specifically for progressive political people to learn and I'm going to teach them three things here are the three things one big science is snowing uh, snowing us over where we have our stupid people who are just parrots who are no longer journalists on TV from uh, NBC, ABC, CM, CM, uh, CBS, uh, MSNBC, Fox, CNN, all those places, those people are no longer journalists. They are just putting out the message that their owners want them to, be, to see. And then we have people who are the same way. And who are they? Bill Nye, the science guy. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, Micho Kiko, or so whatever his name is. I never get his name. He's like, I looks like Einstein. All those guys are basically parrots for big science. I call it big science. And um, that's what I'm calling it. So I'm calling uh, science woke and big science. And so the first thing is to teach progressive. Guess what? They repress people who have different ideas. Science has been has stuck for many years, and that the silent majority of of scientists do not believe in the physics of today, including quantum mechanics, even the the quarks and god particles and all that. They're saying, "Wake me up when you find something real." So the first message is, there is big science, Lisa, and that was one thing that you got me going on all of this. I think it was your inspiration to get the science woke. And so big science is out there. They repress uh, any dissidents who have disagreements and they repress evidence against them. This is just like the political movement. This is just like the rich, the people who have lots of money because I know right now no one watching here is a millionaire. And if you are, hey, we need some money. Not because I need money, but that money would help us get our cause going. I could hire great writers and have these things. So if you know of anybody who has money, who is that who would be like wants to help get people science woke who aren't afraid to take on big science big cosmology big physics physics all that send them my way because i've got things they would do and they'd be really happy i got so many projects it would be awesome we'll get there someday but hopefully before i die uh maybe we can get a get one of those rich people to we're crazy enough to throw money our way but anyways um so the first one is big science so if I go onto these shows, they're going to say, hey, we've got David Hill Street, he's a science progressive. And um, Dave, why are you here? Well, I've got three objectives for being here. And number, number one is to tell you all about something you guys don't know, and that is big science. Physics and cosmology is a mess. They are lost. They, they're um, repressing people. Uh, the new models that we need to go to, they squash you can't go and challenge Einstein. You can't challenge the Big Bang. You can't challenge plate tectonics and give them a better model like expansion tectonics. They don't let you. Not The universities will kick you out or your professors will say, don't do this experiment showing Einstein wrong. Even if you're right, you don't do that. You want a career in physics. That's what's going on. That's number one. Number two is that we have to change climate change to destruction of the earth. We're fixated on the climate change while we can, we are destroying the earth. Climate change is one of the ways we do it. The third thing, the liberals, I, my, I myself am a liberal person, I'm a progressive. People are science Nazis. I don't use that lightly at all. I saw one with Fox just today 
I saw Fox News interview Bill Nye, the science guy. He sounds exactly like what the liberals think the left does when they talk about uh, Trump or religion. And again, I'm not here to say Trump is bad or Trump is good. I'm not here with that. But we are science Nazis. Why? Because if you if you are a liberal, if you're a progressive and someone says, well, you know, I'm not say, sure I'm buying the evidence for climate change, you are immediately labeled crazy that you don't believe in science. Well, guess what? A third of the climate science, the papers on climate change are garbage. Just like a third of all papers are garbage. And what happens? The big companies pick on that. They tell people that climate change isn't real. Climate change is real. But I'm not saying that, um, uh, what, I'm not getting into that argument. But what I'm saying is we become science Nazis. And that's one thing. So we got people like I hope to get on Jimmy Dore and all those people says, look, stop when you let people argue the point. If you don't believe in global warming, bring your data. Let's have a scientific debate. If we're right, they'll bury them. But we don't allow dissidents even on the progressive side. So again, if you're saying, oh, Dave doesn't believe in climate. No, I know because I have looked with some other people in our group at some of the data claimed to show certain things in climate change. It's not good. Some others are good, not all of them. And so when you have a, a big percentage of bad data, guess what? We have an entire dozens of, 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 of Nobel Prizes given to the neutrino, which doesn't exist. Uh, uh, gravity waves, which we don't know if exists, don't even know what those are. The Higgs boson doesn't exist. Uh, uh, the guy uh, that, um, I forget, David somebody, he got a, who supposedly simplified all the 19 variables down to one. Garbage, all the stuff, quantum mechanics, garbage. So to say that we don't have that on site, so number one, Big science is big repression. You can't challenge Einstein, can't challenge the Big Bang, can't challenge these things, and there are people and a lot of evidence for it, can't challenge relativity. Number two, we gotta shift everything to say, we are destroying the earth. Uh, those of you who eat meat, you have to understand that eating meat causes 51% of the greenhouse gases, 13% come from your car. Why is anybody talking about that? Well, because the people who have the lots of make meat are, they know how to manipulate everything. So we have to understand that it's not just glo the global warming. We're looking at the wrong things. Oh, we got a renewable energy. That's 27% maybe of the problem. 51% is because we do animal husbandry and, and grow animals in ridiculous amounts and then that stuff goes in the ocean. We got huge dead zones off the East Coast and in the Gulf of Mexico, dead zones. So that's the other thing, we've gotta change that. So this is my pitch, Lisa. This is not dissident science, not this guy right here. I'm not here to preach to any of my listeners who are probably going away right now. I'm not here. If you don't believe in climate change, great. Look at the data, show it. Show other people, try to convince them. That's what science should be. If you believe that there is global warming, then you have the data, great. If you are even the person who believes in global warming, you find out a, a, a study that's bogus, admit it. You know, they can say, look, this paper right here, this paper that someone wrote, that's weird, uh, some of my sound stuff, this paper that someone wrote, or this, this paper in this book over here, back, back behind me, is garbage, doesn't show it, you gotta throw it out, doesn't help anybody. And then, of course, the third thing is the, us to be stops being science Nazis. And it really comes down to, I use that because it gets people's attention, but it really comes down to us being uh, critical thinkers. You have to entertain everything. So if we think there's global warming and somebody comes along with some, a study that says, wait a minute, I've got some, something that says different. We need to look at it. Keep that debate open. And this is one of the things that I get mad at, that we tell an entire group of people that they don't understand science. I have friends who are creationists and they have some great science. They contribute to science going forward in the critical thinking arena because they don't bring it in to what they're doing, but they still have really great ideas and write great papers. I don't care. That's our problem. We need to be open-minded and look at everything. I don't care if you have a thousand 
a hundred thousand studies about global warming. If one comes along that makes you doubt something, we need to look at it and never say it's always, it's, it's, it's a fact. Because guess what? There are no facts. We cannot prove anything. All we can say is what we think is happening is supported by data, and here's why. Off my pedestal. Does that make sense, Lisa? No, again, folks, remember, I'm not here to tell you it isn't. What I'm telling you is, from our group, you, we need to be tolerant of letting the dissident voices in global warming state their case. If they're wrong, they'll be shown that. And they'll, they'll okay, you're right. The problem is, when we shut down and say, no, you're wrong, global warming's a fact, and you're an idiot. Aren't we the people on the progressive side of politics that hate that kind of attitude? Yeah, we do it with global warming. What? Oh, boy. Well, there's still nine people with me. I didn't drive everybody away. So, yeah, I mean, you're saying right here, Dave, brother Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, I am. what I'm saying is, what we need to do is say, yes, global warming is a problem. But you know what I need brother um, Corbyn to worry about? The meat production. I want to say, hey, Brother Corman, that's really nice. But you know what's worse for the earth right now than even global warming? I mean, what's the worst part of global warming? They don't talk about it. You don't hear, glo you don't hear him saying everybody should become vegan. You hear the United Nations say that. So that's the part of the progressive that I want to bring in. And when I do those three things, let's, stop, let's start allowing dissident voices even in global warming, allow them to be there, allow them to debate. Then we will show them that we're not Nazis and closed-minded like they we accuse them of being. Number two, we need to look at the destruction. Stop talking about global warming. Talk, start talking about the bigger picture, which is the destruction of the earth. Global warming is just one part of it. Go to Amazon, where my wife's from, where I live for, th I didn't live in the Amazon, I lived in Brazil for three years. They're destroying 91% of the destruction of the rainforest is because they're trying to raise cattle. Cattle to great one hamburger takes 2,000 liters of water. When I can feed on the same acre of land or whatever, hectare or whatever it's called, 18 people for the same amount on plants that I can with, with people who eat meat. These are huge problems, but we're all fixated on those, these ones. And I, you know, I am, wouldn't be not surprised if the rich people know this. They keep us oh, you know, occupied with global warming, carbon tax, while the Earth's being destroyed. I mean, uh, when the hurricane hit North Carolina, one of the biggest problems wasn't the hurricane. It was the water that fell on the land that was, that's full of pigs, being raised, full of chickens being raised, full of cattle being raised. It all washed out the sea. And guess what? There's a there's a dead zone now in the Atlantic Ocean that's huge. Well, we don't talk about that. So, yeah, pollution. I, I was raised, I was raised in the 1960s, and the hippies were my teachers. Literally, they were. <laughs> and uh, you know, we learned all about the uh, ecology. That's the biggest problem. We gotta stop, get away from global warming. And then when somebody brings, I, I said that a million thousand times, okay. <laughs> What's this, this Icelandic thing? I love Iceland. Man, those guys have their politics down right. Iceland's a great place. Maybe one of the places that actually moved to and lived. But boy, I just shut off everybody. So anyways, Lisa, what do you think about... <laughs> yes, Dave, you're on fire. How many physicists or engineers have expressed great interest in autodynamics? Almost none. Um, uh, my dad and I, quite a bit. Uh, we subscribe to autodynamics, the idea that um, the world's Newtonian, 
that's how we got to our, if it wasn't for Karazani, we wouldn't have stumbled, my dad wouldn't have stumbled upon what I consider to be the best solution to the wave particle duality problem. And um, no, um, there were some people that seemed to be interested uh, later, uh, but I think Karazani's work is a historic work that really points out, in my opinion, the best arguments against relativity. And gives us an example of the equations that are even used that when you remove the mathematics or the conceptual error that is you move the frame two frames away and put it to one frame you really get a Newtonian world basically it says for this you know Karazani says very some, something very profound and simple this will not move on its own unless it expels some of its own mass so what happens if you look at the autodynamics equation as as velocity increases, the mass gets smaller. Well, that's what a rocket is, folks. If you have no other thing around this, because if you have something else, then it's not a system. The system of, of, of relativity, supposedly, or autodynamics, describes a body. Here's a body. This will move on its own if it expels some of its mass to get itself moving. There's no something like people are going to sort of, you know, no, no. Uh, there's got to be to make this move. That's what autodynamics says at the very uh, smallest level that movement happens. And that's quite profound. And um, so to me, he is a super important historical figure, uh, one to slay the dragon of special relativity, especially. Um, and he also tackled general relativity, saying there's gravitons. And, and um, he, his explanations where nuclear 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 nucleus nucleus collisions he uh, explains with autodynamics without the neutrino and that was another thing that comes out of his work there's no neutrino and the world is in fact Newtonian so uh, it's not going to be people are going to subscribe to it or necessarily use use it it's just going to it's pervasive he is going to be one of the people who in the progression of science was the person who best understood and spent four years of his life from 20 to 24 in Argentina, brilliant mind, looking at this stuff and saying, okay, um, this is what went wrong and this is why. There's only one three dimensions in space. I came up with this explanation for his work. He does it in all mathematics. It took me three or four years. I've said this before, but for those people who are new, uh, basically what he says is very simple, is uh, relativity is based on multiple frames and um, there are no multiple frames in the world. There's only one three-dimensional space. You can move the origin, but you're not going to have inertial frames. There's no such thing as inertial frames. Throw them out. That's what he said. Uh, I absolutely subscribe to that uh, notion. The media never takes science to the task and holds its feet to the fire. Absolutely. Uh, they just assume the scientist says, and there's no question of it. Absolutely. That's what Neil deGrasse Tyson is. Hey, the really good thing is, is if you've been watching, I've been watching, I don't like it as much. It was pretty cool, but I've sort of got too dramatic, is Mars on Nat Geo, the series Mars. And on that, they have Neil deGrasse Tyson, and they have um, Bill Nye, the science guy. And one of the great things, folks, what are they are talking about? They're showing, I'm, I'm, I should do a video on this. They are showing them not as an astrophysicist anymore. Neil deGrasse Tyson is no longer listed as astrophysicist. And I think the engineers who are helping with this documentary or document this um, series, this fictitious series about living on Mars, which is, the, the idea is pretty cool. There's some things they're trying to get a little too dramatic, but it's pretty cool. They don't list him as an astrophysicist because he ain't one, and he's just sort of a journalist, so they list him as the head of something, you know. And then Bill Nye, the same thing, the head of something, which is great. I applaud them because what is this? This is recognition from engineers, from those people who build aerospace and all the all that stuff. I was part of the aerospace. I worked for uh, um, McDonnell Douglas, which was bought by Boeing. Um, and that kind of stuff, and uh, I worked for TRW, which worked on the um, lunar lander uh, um, engine that got the guys off the moon, all those things. Well, these um, these guys probably got on the case and says, no, I am not putting these guys down as, as astrophysicists or whatever they are. They're just bad pat parroting journalists.
You were right, Dave. Currently, you're talking about discussion not happening on the ping. Yep, yep, that's what I'm good. You're getting that. Cool. Also afraid they look because the groomed and accepted by the left. Um, why will then they admit that they are ever wrong? Why will they? Yeah, I don't know either. Science right on on about global warming stuff. David, this uh, right on. Um, yeah, yeah. We we got to change the destruction. We got to let people have their dissonant voices because uh, I when people ask me about global warming, what they ask me, Dave, because a lot of my science friends think, oh, he's got a channel, he's going to write a book about the universe, so he knows everything. I get every science question under the sun because when I go to parties now, I absolutely enjoy talking about science because I don't care about somebody's dog who plays tennis and you know their uncle you know, fell down and broke his leg. And I don't care about those things. Uh, life's short. I'm almost, I'm s almost 60. I want to talk about science, um, art. I love to talk about art, all those kinds of things, anything, anything sort of cerebral. Um, so, so yeah. Um, if I, when people ask me about global warming, what I say, I always say this, I said, look, the trends seem to point in the direction that it is getting hotter. But I tell them, I said, you know, I haven't looked at it personally, so I'd have to look at it more myself. But my gut feeling is, is one of the problems we have is that we can't even predict weather more than five days pretty well into the future, six days. How are we going to predict, predict what's going to happen on this planet? Let's say we are emitting these gases and this idea that it could be an ice age. It could be. Do we know, can, do we have a perfect model, computer model of the earth that works perfectly so that we can predict 30 years into the future, 50 years? We don't know. We're, I mean, with all these things that, w that we are saying is gonna happen, uh, the calculations, I don't know, because I haven't looked at it. So if you ask me, I'm gonna tell you, I don't know. From what I've seen from mass media, is it's getting hotter. Does it seem to be getting hotter? I don't know, yeah, because I've moved to Florida. <laughs> Am I? I am a destructing, destruction earth person. We are destroying the earth. That's why I don't eat any meat. I don't eat any dairy. I don't eat any eggs because besides cruel the animals, they don't, if that doesn't bother you, that's okay. But we are destroying my earth, my earth, my daughter's earth, all of our earth, and that ain't cool. Excuse me. So I'd, I'd urge all my subscribers to subscribe to the notion that we should start stop talking global warming thought and tar, stop talking up start talking about the bigger picture of earth destruction yeah again it's important we look into it first of all if we get rid of our animal husbandry and start eating plants we're going to save a ton of land we're going to be healthier because plant the plant whole plant-based diet is the only diet scientifically this is a fact to have been shown to reverse chronic diseases including my heart disease which my doctor said was 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 genetic um it it, it can reverse our we have cancer every day it's just we crap meat and and dairy and eggs and sugars and all that kind of stuff and we make our bodies defense go we can't we have cancer every day watch television i saw a commercial this isn't a white cell white blood cell eating a cancer cell it does that all the time in my body because i'm giving it a chance what we need to do is we need to be dis destructing earth kind of people that's what we need to concentrate on I recently heard someone Make the bugs on your windshield analogy. Do you see them? Um, it's past our bedtime. Yo, you get up? Okay, well, Lisa, thank you so much. Um, Neil disgraced Tyson at all, or actors. Yeah. You know, absolutely. It's disgusting, and I think people are getting disgusted. When you start seeing on Facebook T-shirts with a halo around Neil deGrasse Tyson's head. Oh my gosh. I think it's I, I think it's starting to get to him. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just skipped fast forward to the science sections. Yeah, it's pretty cool.
Yeah, um, that is true. Uh, a very good comment, Lisa. You know a lot of progressives who are questioning climate change, and it's not because I'm not questioning that. Again, you see, that's what we have to do. I don't care about climate change. I said it. I care of us destroying the earth. All the things that would con would contribute to climate or are contributing to climate change are a destruction of the earth, pollution, uh, all this crap. So let's solve that bigger problem. The other one will cure itself. Hey, I gotta remember that for my... Dave, I totally understand where you're coming from in terms of the diet, but I can tell you right now, uh, you start you start off talking about with that with somebody and they're going to get real defensive. Yeah, absolutely they are. But I think what needs to be done is you need to talk about it in terms of putting it. It's not, you know, if it's offensive, well, I guess I'm, how do you have to care about it? I'm not going to just tell you that you're, you need to know about it. And that's what my idea with being a science progressive, progressive uh, is going to hopefully be, bring and bring this to a lot bigger audience, including, of course, my big goal, other than that, would really to be to show that big science, big physics, big, big cosmology uh, are, are don't allow for dissent. Oh, yeah, mainstream medicine is basically there. You know, in the eight, late 1890s, there was no such thing as heart disease in the journals, in the medical journals. Didn't have it. Why? Because most people were poor and they couldn't afford meat. They couldn't afford dairy because dairy uh, was something in cheese. It was very expensive. They had to have refrigerators and it would go bad. So only the rich had it. And so what happened? <laughs> Cancer, uh, diabetes, and heart disease uh, were a rich man's and woman's uh, disease because they had it and the poor people didn't. What happened? As we got better, um, as people uh, as our whole society was lifted up economically so came a rush of all of our diseases of course nine out of ten of chronic diseases are caused by the mouth if you don't believe me look at bill gates in the study of the number one cause of death in the united states that was i think in 2010 and number two was smoking number one diet so there you go i'm just telling you facts Yeah, I agree. Yep, fracking the whole thing. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, diet. First, you need to stop input of caffeine. <laughs> I don't drink coffee. <laughs> this is me not on drugs. <laughs> I always tell people I should have been accused of being on drugs. Um, probably hyperactivity, perhaps um, a little bit of autism. I don't know. Uh, could be. But no, I, I'm, I can get very, I'm very pumped up without anything, just the brain. Um, hey folks, so if you have any more questions, if not, um, you know, I can talk about some other things here. Um, yeah, I have my friend, she's uh, changed her diet in a very conservative place, but guess what? The people in the conservative south of the United States are starting to see the light on diet as well and the destruction because they lived next to the pig farms and they can't sell their house because it stinks so bad and their water sucks hmm there you go um, let me go uh, now to uh, a, an article uh, to get back to some science stuff here and uh, this one uh, I will go through and just talk about off the cuff because I have not read this a lot of times I will read through these to see, but nope. Um, I'm going to put this out there. And of course, these are for what I call intellects, not for critical thinkers. But I wanted to show you what a critical thinker will talk about. And this is the article from Gizmodo and on in the area of physics. And scientists build atomic clocks accurate enough to measure changes in space-time itself. Now, I've put some uh, arguments on um, Einstein's web uh, web page. <laughs> Not a web page. Einstein's uh, Facebook page, and I get some feedback. But I throw things out there like, "Oh, space-time uh, doesn't exist. It's hard to measure the change uh, of something that doesn't exist." Secondly, I put in the term Clark. No. Time doesn't change. 
clock slow down or clock speed up and that's called clock retardation most of the time they talk about time slowing down so we call that clock retardation stick around and I'll make sure I talk about that or remind me to talk about what that means okay um, so let me read this scientists build atomic clocks accurate enough to measure changes in space-time itself see they make it make they make it sound super important like space-time no you could say you know again I've got a master in linguistics I care about words because I try to get computers to understand this stuff and it's pretty wild to try to understand what people mean by these words and their me their words are full of, full of it a lot of times in, in science scientists build atomic clocks accurate enough to measure changes in space-time they can just say that itself is a way like space-time itself that thing that thing that is just amazing that that uh, incredible space-time it's magical it's the it's the stuff of space and time it's the fabric of as I say I just get disgusted by my own uh, look at I mean how can this not be right look at that it's beautiful it's got colors and it's got you know they dim the lights I mean this is another problem with modern science we get seduced by its artwork we get seduced by people's stories and we forget about science. Got to remember that too. That's pretty wild. Uh, I don't want to treat or share this, so I'm going to bring this down. There you go. You don't need to see that. Um, physicists have created atomic clocks so precise that they can measure deformation in space-time itself, according to new research. <laughs> At least they say it according to re new research. Give them that. A right there. That's that's journalistic style. But it, normally, when they do that, then you get down below, and it's like just. In drooling all over the people, you know, just <gasps> you know, just drooling all over them because they think it's all all correct. We don't we don't all experience time passing equally. Time passes more slowly, closer to something massive and gravity pull, as famously theorized by Albert Einstein. So there we go. We call according to new research, but now we just go into fact. You know, you should see according to Einstein. You know, you need to say this is these are theories, these are ideas, and they're never going to be proven. Uh, but we don't all experience time passing. Uh, time passing equally. I'm thinking, oh, well, he's talking about this emotional time where oh, time's really flying for me. Oh, it's going to be slow because I'm waiting for something. No, it's time passes more slowly, closer to the mass of gravitational pull. And I will tell you, there's actually some explanation Newtonally in why this is, but it's not time that slows down, and gravity. Uh, since gravity is typically interpreted as, as the the way mass warps warp space itself there you go space is nothing we're gonna warp it I want I want you to here's some space warp it how can you warp nothing we have English at least in English and many 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 other languages there's a concept of space space is empty that's why we have it it's the place where things are you can't bend that that means a precise enough atomic clock could serve as an atomic scientific tool for measuring how objects change their shape uh, change the shape of their surrounding space now there's some there, there is something to that but it's not space time I will tell you at the end all right um, we've reported measurements of two clocks in the principle to, uh, in principle, exceed our ability to account for across the surface of the Earth. Andrew, blah, 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 blah. So we've reported measurements of two clocks that in principle exceed our ability to account for across the surface of the Earth, the ti this time effect. So they're, they're saying that we, they've got such, uh, that, that they're trying to find this, uh, they're so sensitive. Clocks are merely tools that measure how time passes by counting uh, a repeating thing but it is uh, uh, being at a swinging pendulum or a vibrating atom. Optical lattice clocks, the ones that are used today study, work in the same way but not quite so simply. You know, the scientists uh, first use, uh, use lasers to set up an atomic... It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because what I'm going to talk about doesn't matter about all that. Um, here the researchers have essentially characterized the frequency of such high precision, blah, 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 blah. So they're just talking about how their clock is very precise, um, uh, I don't care because in the earth it doesn't matter. The characterizing these clocks was well meant that the uh, Eurbidium clocks could detect how Earth's gravity had slowed time accurately determining their location of the gravitational field within a centimeter. 
<laughs> You're going to hear what I'm going to say about this. This is just so funny. This is better than the state-of-the-art earth measuring systems. Okay, so what? Uh, 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 These are gravity detectors, folks. That's all they are. They're not space-time time detectors. They're gravity detectors. It changes in the gravitational field. I'll give you half the answer already. I'll tell you how a, a pendulum clock uh, I'll tell you how a pendulum clock can basically uh, you can understand why the idea of time slowing down is ludicrous also I've got another way to do that too um, uh, a test like that would reveal a high altitude clock ticking faster yeah it will I'll tell you why it's nothing to do with space time you, you, you're, you're not going to believe it uh, since the pull of the Earth's gravity on an object actually decreases slightly as the object moves higher in altitude. It's just the latest effort around the world, the best ever atomic clock. But it's fantastic develops. And blah, 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 blah. But, but, but physicists have ideas how to use them, especially if it comes to hunting for dark, <laughs> for dark matter. They're unicorns. Stuff that our eyes and televisions can't directly see, but which seems to exert some gravitational force throughout the universe. No. Newton describes it, for those who don't know. Uh, gravitational field of a galaxy, in fact, is totally irregular. As you get closer to spiral arms, there's more gravity. Just like as you get closer to something. So a, a galaxy is a non-uniform gravitational field. Everybody can think about that. It's not a point in the middle of the mass. So when you then describe the, uh, uh, the fast, faster moving uh, uh, suns or stars out on the edge of the, the galaxy it's not because of dark matter it's because you can't calculate you're not thinking about gravity as a non-uniform mass it's that simple maybe even the tree to ripple space time and gravitational waves or maybe it's time to move atomic clocks into space where they are less affected by local differences in Earth's gravity it's hard to say now you won't. Now you. Uh, now you can't wear this clock on your wrist or hang it on a wall. It's still set up, built on a lab table. But if you could, it would be pretty sick to be able to tell your friends that you were late because of the gravitational field. Okay, you want to know some answers here. Okay, in the dissonant world, there's a such thing. And we've talked about this many years. I've heard the people in the, this is old terms. This is decades in the making in the NPA and the CMPS. This is the word, get it in your head, clock retardation. I like it because it has retard in it. <laughs> clock retardation, what does it mean? Okay, here's my click, uh, clicking cl uh, pendulum clock. Guess what it depends on, uh, pendulum clock gravity if I take that up into space what happens to it gravity's not pulling down on that thing it doesn't work the same it's going to slow down okay doesn't matter whether it slows down or speed up it changes speed gravity affects other mass mass affects mass so if I freeze you and I slow everything in your body down to almost a complete halt so all the, the the processes of your body of aging doesn't happen very quick at all if any and then it unfreeze you a thousand years later did time stand still no time moved on it's just your body is a physical object and it changed time doesn't change time is movement it doesn't change things will change our measuring instruments are affected by other things in the universe oh that's it this is a great video i gotta do one in clock retardation clock retardation and i said that to somebody and i was arguing that on the einstein facebook page and they're going uh, they're just laughing it's like laughy flaffy face Okay, what do we have here? Light is just a perturbation of ether. That's one model, absolutely. Light as e in ether is one model, but um, ra radic. I want you to explain lasers with ether. I want you to explain dispersion. 
um, which is the rainbow where light has to uh, curve. Um, that's also one of the reasons, one of the things uh, you need to explain. Um, also, what was one other thing? Can't remember. Transverse waves, but laser and lasers. There's another thing I can't remember. Sorry. But those you gotta understand. If you subscribe to Ether, you also have to subscribe to its fail, its problems that it has. Well, uh, Ether is like sound waves. I cannot make my talk go exactly this way. I can keep it sort of this way, but I cannot make my I cannot send sound just to you into your ear. Let's see, nothing as okay. Uh, beats me. I don't know what to talk about when you mention ether. Nikola Tesla Autobiography says the best, blah, 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 blah. I will talk about ether sometime. Um, how much time have been like, ooh, wow, it's an hour and a half. My goodness, people are still around. I know people come and go because of their time, their time frames. It's uh, clock retardations going on. But totally bad analogy, wrong place to put that. I don't know why I said it, just because I've said it. But uh, ether is basically a bunch of things that is just like bunches of particles and mm -hmm. waves are, are done like that. So a wave comes through like that. A heavier wave will go like that. So if you have three, this one hits this one, this one hits this one. I wonder if I can do this, this would be cool. Look at this. This hits this, which hits this, which hits that, and it keeps. And so the particles stay around, just like air particles stay around. But waves can be through, go through it, just like you have water that's still, and you can have different waves. I was looking at part uh, waves colliding in my reflection on the ceiling from a, a pond on my flat roof. Which who would ever build a flat roof in Florida? For, I don't know, idiot architects. Um, I can say that I got a minor in architecture, so those guys built this stupid thing. But it gives me the affords me to see the ripples in the water when the things come along and you see the interference patterns on the ceiling because of the light that reflects off of from the sun. And I notice when you get lots and lots of waves, just like when you get lots and lots and lots and lots of people talking in a room, it gets really, really hard to understand because those things have so much interference. So when you have a, a room of a thousand people speaking, I can see that person really clearly, but I can't hear them. Now, if light is in that form and not in particle form as waves of particles, I have a hard time trying to model that. So that was one of the interesting. But anyways, ether models is very, uh, I'm, I'm trying to do a talk on that, but I'm gonna have to spend more time because it's very interesting. Uh, don't get me wrong. It could be ether. That could be the answer. We don't know. We're in model revolution. Read sciencework. Oh, you can't. It's not done yet. Sciencework.org, I have that science revolution why we are in model revolution right now Easter is the delta of nothing to something period <laughs> um, not they are no they're not ether might be a bad thing but they aren't what you sh show well Ether is of ether, the idea of ether, it's a medium through which waves propagate. The thing, the medium itself does not propagate. It can move, it can flow, but the waves of light in ether theories propagate through a medium. That's what it means. You can have 17 different ways to say it's not that. Then if it's not that, then it's not an ether theory. Come up with a different name. No problem. I think you're just we're getting into the way we're talking and the words we use. So um, this is science. You can focus ultrasound into beams and even levitate objects. You can, but you hear that. Yeah, you can. Absolutely. But that you don't take sound and point it over there and lift up. 
it's a pattern which you put stuff in interference wise you make those interference pattern do certain things to make that happen it's not the same as a laser which is a beam that mm -hmm. goes straight for almost forever without spreading out so yes you can do that you can cause vibrations in that but then you hide i don't see that happening in a laser in, in ending up in a laser so yeah you can you can do things like that and there's a lot of things that either and i could be absolutely wrong the particle model could be absolutely wrong and ether could win out and that's what we'll be talking about 100 years from now and they're all laugh at dave and dave uh d hilster and d hilster's particle model absolutely could happen i'm not a person to say that so ether could win it's I think there's an emotional component. Again, I'm making a talk about it, and I did talk. Go to 2018, the, go to our youtube.naturalphilosophy.org. Go to 2018, CMPS 2018, see my talk on ether. I talk about the emotional component. We want it to be it. It's, it, it's, it's built into us that we want to think it's light because it looks like it should be a wave and something. But we have an entirely perfect other explanation that it's particles waves of particles it's a digital world how do we send digital information we send uh, bursts in like brr, 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 brr. We, 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 it's like morse code there's no waves there digital information gives us a perfect example of how we can even we can send frequencies using digital information what is that particles it can happen so that there is another thing it's not as intuitive it's not intuitive it has some things in my opinion that are better my opinion a laser point uh, source coherent so what there's a point is a point source no a point source what does it mean by that i'm saying that if you have an ether you can have a point source but it's not going to go in a straight line What's a point source mean? It's going to hit stuff, and in by the nature, it's going to spread out. By the nature of, unless you, you know, unless you come up with some really skillful idea of what the shape of those things. But then, if I think if you do, then you're going to have the problem of it's going to be have to be like neutrinos or particle physics, where you have to have certain uh, to make a laser. Uh, you gotta be careful. Again, it's okay. Dave, is the losing mass by shining the sun? Yes. And, and, and uh, well, depends on what model you're talking about. When you have the sun in an ether model, it's going to vibrate and it's going to uh, impose uh, um, uh, hit the ether around it and cause that those waves to travel toward the earth and everything that we uh, what we see so in the ether model you're not going to have light being a transfer of mass you're going to have light being a transfer of kinetic energy uh, it will move mass, so you move one particle of ether, which hits another particle of ether, so that kinetic energy, and it's got to be super elastic, obviously, super elastic, to go 10 billion years, for instance, the elasticity. That's one of the arguments against ether, but we've done some calculations. It's not so radical as it seems. Um, in the particle model, yeah, those things are coming at you, so we're they're losing them. Um, and that's one of the ideas in the particle model, is gravity and light is... Uh, traveling at the speed of light, they both uh, arrive at the same time. There are experiments done during full eclipses to show that. And yep, yeah, yep, absolutely. And uh, that's what we say in a particle model. So in that case, yeah, you could have something just vibrating, and just the vibration will cause that, and you don't have a transfer of mass. In ours, you do. Uh, yeah. So it's losing mass. So, but it's also gain. Problem is, is that the same amount that a sun's putting out is putting out a lot, but it's also receiving, and that's what gravity is. It's a very low-level sort of background. Suns are sending G1 particles throughout the entire universe. That's what we say. 
So yeah, it's a different system. Yep, very good. Hey, that may be a way to, to test which uh, model may be better. Could shoot down the particle model, which could happen. How do you think sonar luminescence happens? Nikola Tesla educated education for the win. Oh, just nobody tried sonar luminescence on Mercury. They use photons as an analogy, go both ways, but analogy to photons and matter waves, phonons, which have treated wave, yeah. See, this is where they're trying to solve the wave particle duality, and, and I think my father's solution is much better, not because he's my father. He, he, was, he talked about a thousand things that night, and then when he got to that one, I go, whoa! So yeah, you got that problem. Whereas the particle model, in our particle model, we have that problem. Waves are, Waves are waves of particles, just like bombers are waves of planes. You can have waves and they can have frequencies of just waves of particles. It's pretty, pretty simple. And that model is you can do lasers because you shoot them. Those particles come out of a laser in the straight line. Where, where do they come from um, in a laser? If you have the particle model. See this? This is a, a battery. And in here, what we would call G1 particles, or you would call electricity, or you would call electrons. We call them G1 particles because the mainstream doesn't call uh, electrons and uh, electricity and magnetic fields and light and gravity the same particle we do. So when you put this into something and it shoots a later laser. You're shooting the particles out of this. That's our model. Is it right? We don't know. All the models, the only thing I know for sure, the current except the main. <laughs> well, you get, you know, if I had a t shirt, I would send it to you, uh, erratic. I would send it to you. Love it. Love it. Love it. That's a great way of putting it. Basically, there's another way of putting it too. All the models. Most all of the models that I know of are better than mainstreams. Why do you think people come up with another model? Uh, because I was uh, uh, doing mushrooms on a mountain and uh, I had this hallucination and this thing came down, giant turtle came down from the, from, the, from the sea and the sky and it told me, no, people are coming up with new models because they think the current one sucks. But I love that, look at that. He says, again, all of the models the only thing I know for sure is the current accepted mainstream is the is one the one is that, that's wrong. <laughs> Lasers have focusing mirrors. Uh, yeah, they do, but you still have the problem. Once those are the 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 energy the movement is released into the ether, it's not going to hit just those in front of it. It won't happen just on collision particle collision you're going to have them hit like this they're not all going to hit perfectly in line like cue balls it's not going to happen there's one's going to come like this it's going to come out of the laser focused and it's going to go off that direction that's why that's the explanation why it doesn't matter if it's focused no matter what you do you can focus light to a certain port to get most of it but it spreads out we can focus it to a certain point, but it will spread out and, you know, do that. It's not the same as a, um, a laser. Hey, here it says, um, here is, there's no negative value in the universe. Uh, it's one of the main issues right now in science. Yeah, is it? Well, that's cool. Uh, variable number system, my father, um, another guy, Jack, I think is his name, I'm not sure, I don't quote me, but he's a new guy to our group and he talks about that. He's got a whole number system, he says, no negatives. Laser light exploits negative temperature, which means entropy is to decrease. Maybe, I'm not sure, um, it's not, I'm not really super familiar with optics, so yeah uh, 
Uh, and I think the difference when you focus a, 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 a beam of light and you focus that and you can do it, it's going to spread out no matter what you do, it's spreading out. It will not stay the same, whereas laser light will stay the same for a ridiculous amount. Um, in fact, so much so that they send laser light to the moon. That was the first experiment that I think they put on Apollo 11. And that's how they can measure that the moon is moving away a quarter inch a year or something. Okay, folks, um, any more questions? But th listen, I thank you. And those people who are ethers, please don't get mad at me. I'm not here. I'm making sure, because I'm your science therapist, remember that. My goal is not, is the only thing I don't like about ethers, they do not face their problems with the ether model. They do not address them, they ignore them at all expense so that they can keep ether. Uh, ether, uh, oh, I remember what the other thing is. One of the things I say about ether. Ether, you have to fit gravity into. You have to say, oh, I've got ether, and now I've got to figure out how gravity works with the ether. Ether is a light-based, I'm telling you, pardon my dog. Um, but ether is, is, is a light-based model. It's not interested in gravity. And then what happens? Oh, ether's everything, so now I've got to put gravity into it. I've got to put chocolate bars into it, and I've got to put... Uh, green rocks into it and then if it doesn't have you know I'm gonna fit them in no matter what so make sure you don't fall in love with it my father and I are trying to bust ours all the time I'm the first to tell you of I will tell you at least a dozen things about our model at a fundamental level I don't like and if you do not have that attitude uh, toward uh, your own theory or what you believe in ether theory or lattice theory or particle theory if you fall in love with it and you try to make everything fit and every time anybody comes up with something against it you try to quickly logically explain it then my opinion you do not have a critical thinking attitude you got to remember that all theories and models are wrong we just try to come up with better ones that can be useful and I think in the end any theory worth anything, any model worth anything, will eventually lead to technological advances. Why? It's pretty simple. If you have a model that mimics the the United States, the universe. Why the United States the universe? That's so politically incorrect, and I feel terrible about that. Which, like you know, the United States is to me is another state. Uh, countries shouldn't even exist so much. Regardless of that, um, this whole idea that. Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's okay. Anyways, um, if you if I want could rewind and go back to it, uh, yeah, well, it's it's falling in love with your own theories is is in general what I'm saying. Just be very careful not to do that, and um, be careful to always keep that engineering attitude, which I call. Okay. Any other questions? Electricity doesn't exist. It isn't needed. Um, I don't know what you mean by that, but we certainly have have uh, circuits that have a force that flows around it in the sense of something that does stuff. So in our model, for instance, in ether models, it's actually waves in the ether that's just trapped inside wires and doesn't get out uh, that much, gets out a little bit. In our particle model, it's just particles flowing through. But I'm not sure that's that's there's something there's you know go stick your finger in a socket and tell me that there's no electricity unless you're calling it something else but that's something and that electricity has to be explained some way Let's see power see go see the primer field theory david lamp point channel should steer you in the right direction <laughs> i second that motion Oh my goodness, people are still uh, coming here. Welcome everybody. Um, you got any more questions? Because if not, I'm going to head off. I'm coming up to almost two hours. Laser spot on the moon is four miles across. Is it? Could be. Really? Well, it could be. Because I think their laser actually is pretty big. Um, is it laser? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's pretty big. It spreads out too. I believe it. Even in the particle model, it'll it will spread out eventually. You know, having it totally cohesive. But 
it goes for a long time it goes for a long distance and it's certainly it's something we need to explain I know in ether theory it's hard to explain and particle model is simpler to explain I guess that's probably in the end the only explanation for that so <laughs> okay no problem I can laugh um, it meant metaphorically jump off the diving board and let me know if there's no gravity okay <laughs> I got gotcha. you sorry about that uh, nothing is the seems. Uh, wait, no, no. Here's one. Uh, Illuminati Socrates. Dissonant science. Could oscillating neutrinos uh, actually be cavitating bubbles of something? Um, throw away the neutrino and, and pick any other particle that maybe exists that you explained to me. Sure. Throw away the neutrino, folks. It's, it was invented. Absolutely. In fact, Karazani. Until you come back to me and say, I read Karazani, here's where he's wrong, and here's why we can really say that neutrinos exist, um, I, I can't go for that. Because my critical mind will not go that direction because I've read Karazani's work. The neutrinos are a joke, even amongst the particle model people. But today and age, they're believing anything. So I'm sorry about that. I can't believe that. If, you, if you're a person, uh, like I said, come back to me. Show me that uh, Karazani's work's not not uh, uh, good so, uh, good logic. The bigger the being, it spreads a bit. Uh, okay, but why ask the celestial current? Uh, in wave theory, it's predictable how much it spreads based on the wavelength. Yeah, that's probably true. Partly true, yes. And it uh, seems to look up distinty. Okay, that's good. Socrates, yes, I think so. What? Explain pyro wave theory. Oh, you guys are talking amongst yourselves. That's fine. Saying light is waves predicts why and how many are laser spreads. You can have waves of particles, folks, too. So, again, uh, you have to. These are the assumptions. Remember, I'm gonna. I mean, I'm gonna close this down because I know you guys uh, absolutely can continue talking. But uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna take off here. But again, I would go back to Neil Munch. And one of the problems is you don't want to talk in vacuums when you talk about waves and all these things. So you, you got to say, I'm an etherist, so I'm talking about ether. Or I'm a particle model guy, I'm talking about model particle. I'm a lattice person, so I think waves are happening in a lattice. And a lattice is basically, um, you know, look at, look at the beer bubbles example with Bruce Nappy. 2017 or 2018, I can't remember. I tried 2016 maybe. I don't remember. One of those years. So... Okay, well, listen, guys, thank you so much. I appreciate it. My goodness, people staying around, it's greatly appreciated. Um, my goal here isn't to remember, do not stop working on your ideas with models. Just be careful. Don't fall in love with them. Make sure you understand what model you're using, the words you're using, what models you're attaching it to. The words are very important. Your assumptions are very important. All of these things. Don't go blah without thinking about what you're saying and really spend some time knowing what assumptions you have about the universe and what you're building upon so that other people, otherwise when you say something without your assumptions, my assumptions are A, B, and C, yours is D, E, and F, D, E, even F, and those assumptions do, do not mesh, have, have conflicts and so when I say wave and you say wave we're meaning totally different things in our minds and we have to understand that so when I'm talking to an etherist I think about their model so when they're talking about it I say okay they're an etherist and when they're talking wave I know what they're talking about okay all right guys take care semantics absolutely but semantics are everything folks why it's the meaning of what we're trying to say there's something i have in here there the universe gives me all this input through eyes nose mouth the whole thing that all of our senses comes into my brain i make models of it and then i use language which is a stream of sound waves of words and and, and these things that i then try to recreate the same thing in your brain and guess what it's really important the semantics because that's all we have because i'm not going to just point to you or I can hold something I'm handed to you and not need language but this uh my idea Lesage theory with neutrino bubbles carry 
Get away from neutrinos. Throw them out. Okay, replace neutrinos with something and I'll start talking to you, okay? Mr. Socrates, got get rid of them. They don't exist. Lots of people, there's a lot of people in this in science know they don't exist. Just call them something else. Call it an ether. I don't have a model. I just want the truth from the universe perspective. Perfectly good uh, mention. The only thing I know is the delta scale, nothing other. Blah, 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 blah. Sleep well, Dave. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you, Radic. I appreciate that one thing that all I, uh, there, there are lots of new models, but all I know is the current one is wrong. Remember, I'm Dave DeHilster. Stay critical, stay thinking. Uh, I'm your science therapist. Ciao for now, folks.